Welcome book nerds to this episode of the Gene Book Nerd Podcast. For this episode, I'll be speaking with John Gray, author of The Desecrated, An Ancient Curse, A Haunted Morgue, Boneless Corpses and Missing Bodies, Gruesome Murders and Centuries Old Mysteries, and a complex young woman with a dark, painful past, determined to get to the bottom of it all. John Gray certainly knows what he's doing when it comes to the world of the paranormal and dealing with ghosts. So, you can rest assured with this book, it'll be no different. Let's get to it and hear more about his book. All right, book nerds, I'm now speaking with John Gray. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really excited to chat with you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Well, for those who may not be familiar with you, uh, would you please introduce yourself for us? Well, as you said, my name is John Gray. Um, Most of my life, I've been a, a writer and director of films and television. And most recently, I've turned to uh, novel writing and I've just written my first novel, which just got published this past summer. And that's part of what we're here to talk about. (laughs) Thanks. Well, big congratulations before we get into the interview. I'm sure writing a book uh, from many people I've spoken to on this podcast, writing a book is no easy feat. So congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) That's true. So as you said, we're here to talk about your latest work, uh, your book, The Desecrated. Uh, Would you mind telling us a little about it? Well, it's basically, uh, it's a supernatural thriller. Uh, It's set mostly in a morgue. And it's about this sort of um, troubled young woman who's working the night shift at the morgue. And she's had a lot of tragedy in her her life. Uh, She just lost her father. Um, uh, And along when, when her father passed away, um, her source of financing for her, her college tuition went away, and she her goal had been to be a doctor, and she was in, taking pre-med classes. So she's at a point in her life where she is just sort of taking a breath, um, and she's found a job in this morgue through a professor of hers at, at her school. Uh, and it's, it's perfect for her right now because it's, it's at night, it's, she's alone, um, she doesn't care about being around the dead, doesn't bother her at all. Uh, and so for her, it's a way to kind of regroup and try to figure out what's next for her. Uh, and this sort of peace uh, in her life um, basically gets destroyed when a young English movie star, kind of heartthrob named Trevor Price, is sentenced to uh, community service at the morgue. And Trevor is this very, very uh, um, irreverent, uh, you know, partying kind of guy uh, who just brings a whole different energy to the morgue. And she believes that his antics in the morgue set off this old uh, kind of ancient curse. And the morgue becomes haunted and then and becomes more seriously and dangerously haunted until uh, she, in the end, has to sort of save the day. <laughs> That's the Reader's Digest version. Awesome. Well, one thing I want to ask you in particular is, I mean, you said the, your book is set in a morgue which kind of makes sense because obviously, you know, a more dead bodies, but when people, a lot of thing, you know, think of, you know, supernatural activity and, you know, the books entitled Desecrated, you would think uh, like a haunted house or a graveyard or, you know, a, a ship off, you know, that sunk off like a ghost ship or, you know, air, you know, some kind of like tragic event or something like that. I'm curious why, what was your motivation for choosing a morgue? Like what brought you to, to that? is that um, I personally find the idea of more you know, very, very scary and kind of weird. Um, and also, I'm a big fan of gothic horror. You know, I'm less a fan of slasher kind of horror, um, although there's a, fa- there's a fair amount of gore in my novel for sure. But mostly, I'm really interested in sort of the elements of gothic horror, you know, haunted houses, the cemetery, um, uh, you know, an old morgue. Um, so for me, that, that's an atmosphere that I really kind of like and want to you know, sort of live in and think there's a lot of horror potential, a lot of scary potential uh, in, in a morgue. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, in fact, I'm, you know, I, I had a TV show called Ghost Whisperer, and uh, I was so enamored of the idea of morgues. In one of our seasons, we decided to, to build a morgue set 
that will become a, a regular set for our show that that season. You know, we're always having these happening in the morgue. So it, it's just sort of a familiar place for me, um, horror wise, and uh, and something that, that, that scares the hell out of me. So I love to write about it. When you were um, doing your research about morgues, did you did you learn anything that, you know, people might find interesting or, you know, kind of like, oh, what most people don't know about, you know, morgues that maybe is integrated into the story at all or people might learn, you know, I'm not sure how many people are interested in learning about morgues per se, but is there anything like that you find or, or readers will find interesting and like kind of learn more about morgues in the process? Well, I, I did do a lot of research. I spoke to quite a few people who worked at morgues, who ran morgues. And, you know, the biggest thing I came away with was just how kind of routine uh, and, and you know, sort of banal it gets for the people who work there. Um, it doesn't take long for them to kind of lose the idea that they're working with dead bodies and people who were once alive. Um, you know, there, there are routines, there are certain things that have to be done. Photographs have to be taken, the body has to be weighed, the body has to be undressed, the clothes have to be put away in a certain way. All the, uh, the uh, um, you know, watches, rings, everything that's on the body has to be accounted for. Uh, and so, you know, it kind of becomes a, a dull routine in some ways, uh, unless you're a morgue in a, in a supernatural thriller novel. <laughs> but the, the other thing that I, have to, I should really point out, which I think is kind of funny, what inspired this idea in the first place is back in 2015, Lindsay Lohan, um, in one of her many DUI uh, um, trials or, or cases, uh, was sentenced to uh, community service at the LA County Morgue. Huh. And she did it. She, she fulfilled that, that sentence. And I always thought that was just an amazing kind of thing. Like who would think of that? Like a judge has got a great sense of humor to, to come up with that idea. And what that must have been like for just the kind of ordinary people who work at the morgue, suddenly there's Lindsay Lohan with them. Uh, so that idea kind of just kept tumbling around in my head for a long time. And when I started really seriously thinking about it as a story, uh, I decided to flip it and make it a male movie star who was kind of a macho you know, sort of guy and um, a, a more troubled young woman who uh, he encounters at the morgue. And, it felt just a little bit better for me. So that's sort of what, how the morgue came, came along in the first place. Interesting. I didn't know that uh, people having to serve community service at a morgue was actually a thing. I, it's the first I've ever heard of it, but you know, she did it. I actually, I spoke to the guy who runs the LA County morgue and was her boss. And he said that um, she did great. You know, I mean, the first day, I think she came late uh, and he wouldn't let her in. He said, nope. You cannot be late. You'll start over again tomorrow, off day one. And then, and she came in, and, and I think she brought cupcakes or something for for everybody. And he said, "No, you can't do that. Um, come back again tomorrow." So you know, it was a very tough kind of uh, uh, set of rules for her. Yeah, she said that she did great, and she did her did her work without complaint, and everyone seemed to like her, and uh, just a, you know, just one of these oddball things. Oh yeah, well, like you said, um, you know, you. There's very set, strict rules, which makes which makes perfect sense. I mean, got to keep everything clean, organized. I mean, yeah. So um, one thing you mentioned is uh, for any of our listeners uh, out there, like I said, who may or may not know you, you were you created a show, Ghost Whisper, a huge TV show. And obviously that's set in kind of like the same genre as this book. So I'm curious to know. For you and I've asked other, you know, directors, authors, people uh, before is when you work in different forms of media, you know, all doing uh, supernatural thrillers or sci-fi or horror, or whatever. It's I'm sure it's very important to make sure that all the pieces feel like their own separate uh, identity and they don't all feel like they're kind of like the same thing. So coming from, you know, the TV shows and the uh, Ghost Whisper and everything. To writing this book what was your process for making sure that this kind of was its own standalone project and wouldn't feel like it's part of another world well you know i think it it, it begins with just the characters you know the characters of course are, are very very different um although the main character in desecrated um uh, does have 
some kind of psychic abilities that, that are sort of latent that she's trying, uh, she's not sure she really has them or not. Uh, that's really the only, I think, real overlap you know, with Ghost Whisperer, except that they're, you know, they both have elements of Gothic horror. Um, you know, Ghost Whisperer was a, a more complicated show than it would seem on the surface because it was a partly a Gothic horror show. It was partly a mystery in which every week a, a case had to be solved. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the onion had to be unpeeled. Um, uh, it was an emotional drama. Um, you know, we saw these characters kind of have an arc throughout the episode. And there were comic elements. And so um, a lot of the, you know, the writing staff found it very challenging because it, every episode had to hit all those marks. Uh, and so it was, you know, very a little a little challenging in that way. Um, this novel, I think, is edgier. It's a little darker. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, the the underlying mythology in the novel is a lot scarier, I think, than it was in, in Ghost Whisperer. Um, but you know, I, I think ultimately, I'm you know, as a person who writes, you know, I'm interested in characters. I'm interested in their journey. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in emotional drama, and I try to uh, keep that alive no matter what I'm writing. If I'm writing a comedy or I'm writing horror, uh, it all has to be about people that you care about. Um, so that has to be the first priority, you know, at all times. And so we, you know, we prided ourself, uh, ourselves on Ghost Whisperer in having fully developed characters, and which is one of the reasons why we always had such a great guest cast, because uh, actors were really eager to play those roles because they were kind of juicy. And I've done this, I've tried to do, I hope I've, you know, the readers will tell me, but I've tried to do the same thing with this novel, uh, populating it with really rich characters. Um, some of them are very dark um, and troubled and tortured. Some of them are just downright evil. Um, some are funny, um, but hopefully, even though you may not like them all, you'll come away understanding them all and feeling something for them. Awesome. Well, I also think it's important whenever you read a book to have, you know, it's it's always great not liking every character. I feel like that kind of gets a little more boring when you're like, oh, I like enjoy all these characters because then it kind of there's no tension. There's no like, oh, I mean, I've I read books and it's like, oh, man, this character, like they're such a you know horrible person. But that adds so much dynamic for the story. So yeah. I think doing something yeah. like that's really important. Um, I, think, I think every writer wants that moment, you know, in their book or their movie. Um, where a certain character appears and the readers are like, okay, what's going to happen now? You know, we know this guy's a son of a bitch. You know, what's yeah. going to happen? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, a lot, it's great fun to do that. Oh, absolutely. I'm, and I'm sure the, the uh, you know, coming up with the characters was a lot of fun and like all the backstories and the plot. I'm curious to know what your process was for that. I know a lot of writers that I speak to, sometimes they just, start writing and just see where the story takes them and they'll make decisions as they're writing some people you know i've spoken to some people and they write out huge backstories and map everything out before they've even written the first page of uh of the book i'm curious what your process was for coming up with the characters how much backstory like how much time you spent on that was there any personal uh experiences put in there or any possibly any characters based on or taking inspiration from people in your life that you know for the characters? Well, you know, it, it, it's a, um, it, it was a lot of fun for me to, to, to do this, to come up with these backstories, because it's a luxury you don't often have when you're writing a script. Because normally you're writing, if it's a feature film, it's, you know, it's, it's got to hit a certain time limit. You're not as limited as you are in television, but you still, you know, it has to be within a two hour basically framework. If you're writing television, it's also got to, you're not constrained. So while you can't just you know go crazy and, and write stuff that, that just goes on and on, there is a freedom now to, to have some depth and to really explore these characters and explore the backstories. And um, you know, I've always been envious of those writers who can kind of make it up as they go along. Because it seems like it would be so much easier for me, you know. But I can't do that. I really have to have the story kind of mapped out and the characters. You're pretty much mapped out. I don't. I don't dot every I and cross every T, because uh, I want to leave some room for for magic. You know when I'm actually writing. So there's sort of like an art to knowing when I've outlined enough. Now I'm ready to start writing, and, and we'll see what else is going to come. 
but it's it's great fun. And uh, you know, in this we have one character who who came from Turkey, and I've never been to Turkey, so it was great fun to research that. And this guy had been a grave digger in Turkey, and to sort of imagine what that would have been like, and get all the research done. And of course, you know, in the, in the wonderful digital age we're in, uh, research is so easy. Um, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm old enough <laughs> to know when I, you know, when I was writing years and years ago, uh, and research meant a trip to the library, and you have to have your list with you, and you go to the library, you get all your stuff, and then and take it back to write, and you realize, oh, I forgot this, oh, I got to go back to the library. <laughs> So you know, now, of course, it's just so great to just, you know, a couple of keystrokes and, and, and you're there. Um, so I, I love the, the novel writing process. Uh, not, I guess, not every aspect of it, but mostly the, the character part of it, where uh, I, I, you know, if I, if I wanted to delve into a character's background some more, I could just go down this little alleyway and tell a funny story or a scary thing that this guy did or this person did. Uh, and um, it was really kind of rewarding and, and you know, great fun, much more liberating than having to write a script where you often can't, so that you have a great idea for what could be this, in this character's backstory, and you have to save it to tell the actor because you can't really fit it in the script. Gotcha. Well, uh, something that you touched on earlier that I'm very curious to know about is um, writing for different mediums. I'm sure, you know, it's, I'm sure it varies, but I'm curious to know your take on, because not only for, like you said, on the length, because, you know, a TV show or a movie versus a book, obviously you have so much more time to get the story out in a book. But when you're writing, you know, you wrote this book, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that it was just you writing this, whereas on movies and TV shows, you usually have a bunch of writers. So I'm curious to know, was the how different was the process? Did you find it more challenging writing by yourself versus having other people to kind of collaborate with or, you know, bouncing ideas off? Like, what was that like? Well, that's a great question because, um, you know, I, I came late to the world of series television. Um, you know, my first show was Ghost Whisperer. And, and uh, I, up until that point, I had just written as a solo writer. I, I wrote movies and I directed them. So okay. I was sort of used to, for 25, whatever it was, years, of that sort of thing. I write a movie, direct it, edit it, here comes the next one. So on Ghost Whisperer, my first experience with a writer's room, where we have like eight really smart people in this room, and uh, I had trouble with it. I have to be honest, you know, I was so not used to it. <laughs> and it was very difficult for me to sit there and sort of get all these ideas thrown at me by these really smart people and every idea sounds better than the last one. Whereas I, I'm used to just having to you know, be by myself at the keyboard, think things through and take my time with it. So ultimately on Ghost Whisper, what I did was a little unusual, I guess, for the series world, but I worked with the writers more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You know, we would convene the room if we had to break a big story or one of the writers having a problem with the story and you had to have this sort of hive mind but for the most part, I would encourage the writers to work on their own and come to me when they have something ready. And I was much more comfortable with that, or getting their material and then spending a day with it on my own, and then coming back to them. So I, I was kind of already teed up to write a novel because most of my training had been <laughs> just me <laughs> in the room uh, and the keyboard. Um, so, you know, it, it was not a big adjustment in that way. Okay, interesting. Um... Roughly, how long did it take you to write uh, this book, The Death Created? I guess all in all, you know, if you don't count the amount of years, the idea was just kind of percolating in my head. No, I mean, just like from when you're yeah. like, all right, I'm going to write this, sitting down and, you know, putting yeah. that first word on paper to the finish. Because, I, again, I speak to a lot of authors and people and some people are like, oh, I knocked this book out in six weeks. And some people I spoke to, they're, oh, you know, this took three years. I, it took me about a year. It was about a solid year. Uh, and, okay. you know, there, there were some gaps in between drafts where I would let it sit for a while and then come back to it a couple of weeks later. Um, but, you know, basically, uh, I always want to write a novel. It's, it's on my bucket list. And um, uh, when the pandemic hit, I just thought, this is it. This is the time. All my projects, all my film projects dried up. My TV projects dried up. Uh, we all have to stay home. And I thought, if you can't write a novel now, <laughs> you'll never write it. 
So <laughs> that's when I just buckled down and used the pandemic to uh, to sit home and, and write. And and for that year, um, you know, I spent writing it. And then it took about another year to get it, uh, you know, placed with a publisher and, and out there. As you were coming to, you know, as you wrote the, um, as you wrote this book, did you ever find times uh, where you're like, ah, oh, you know, I just gotta, I gotta rework this, or, you know, how did you, because as a, you know, an artist myself, I always definitely run into issues of like, you know, I'm a perfectionist, and I'm like, oh, I, you know, I, it could always be better, it could always change this. What if I do this? What if I do this? How, you know, what was your process for just kind of picking an idea, sticking with it? Did you ever feel like you had to go back and like change things or rework things? Absolutely. But, but you know, the, the discipline that I sort of developed a, a, as a screenwriter um, is that, and, and you know, people think, oh, he's so disciplined, but really it's because I'm not very disciplined. <laughs> I impose the discipline on me very, very carefully. But when I'm writing, uh, I, I, my goal is to get through the first draft, no matter what happens. I follow my outline and I just power through that draft, even though uh, I know sometimes when I'm writing, oh no, this isn't gonna work, it's, that's not gonna work now. Um, but I know if I stop and try to fix it or I go back and reread something, because the other thing, I, I don't reread. Wherever okay. I start the night before, that's where I start the next morning and I just go through it. Because if I start to read it or I go back, I'll get lost in the woods. I'll just I'll start to tinker and then, well, that's not right. This isn't right. And, and then before you know it, you know, a couple of months has gone by and I haven't made any progress. I'm still dickering with, with these. So I, I make notes as I go along, like, okay, this doesn't work and here's why, but okay, I'll fix that when I go back. And sometimes I'll get like an amazing idea halfway through it. Oh shit, I now I gotta go back to the beginning. The whole beginning is gonna change, but I still, I go, I get to the end of that first draft. Uh, and once I get to that, once I get that first draft done, then I feel like I'm unstoppable. Now, like I've done the hardest thing there is to do, even though I'm going to write, you know, who knows how many more drafts. <laughs> but that first one is the most difficult one to get to. And so when you get to the end, um, you know, pop a bottle of champagne. This is great. Take a day off and back to it. You know, and, and, and for me, that, that's how it works best. Awesome. Well, now that you've got this book under your belt, uh, are there any plans for more books in the future? Is there any current plans for, uh, uh, you know, maybe a different series or uh, any other works that you have uh, either in the pipeline now or uh, up here in your mind that you'd like to kind of hint at for us? Yeah, I am. I am working on uh, a thriller novel, it's not supernatural. It's just a straight out thriller. Very, very complicated, uh, multiple points of views. It's going to be very challenging to write it. But if I can pull it off, I think it'll be really a fun, you know, fun, twisty thriller. And, um, you know, I've got some ideas for a sequel for The Desecrated. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll see um, if, if, that's, if that's warranted. <laughs> you know, people will care about a sequel. But I do have some fun ideas for that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, I've, been kind of outlining it here and there and uh i've also been making short films and i just finished a, a short film uh and it's funny you know it sort of goes back to the idea of telling a story in a limited amount of time um because the short film format is a great way uh to to learn uh, really economic storytelling you know how can you tell my my shorts are anywhere from seven to 13 minutes and it's really the thing of like how can you tell the story in as short amount of time as possible, but still make people feel something, still have very clear characters. Uh, and so it's very challenging and, and fun. And I'm just about to, I'm just finishing up one right now. And uh, my goal is to get to work on the thriller novel um, in the next few days. Awesome, That's that sounds amazing. I know, uh, again, as a filmmaker myself, I definitely know how challenging it can be to uh, to get, you know, tell a complete story when you only have 10 minutes or you know keeping right, it keeping right. it short <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely have to keep every you know only what's necessary and you always add there's always too much extra so you gotta kind of throw sometimes you just gotta throw uh throw some stuff away just to keep that time down down yeah. so yes that's exactly. exactly well where can our listeners learn more about you and uh where is your book available uh, for our readers who want to grab a copy 
Well, you know, the book is available on all of the uh, normal platforms, you know, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. You can go into a Barnes and Noble and order it. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, J Thomas Gray, G R A Y. Um, I'm also, uh, my website is johngrayofficial.com. And on that website, um, you can see a seven minute short film which is basically uh, a scene from the novel. Ooh, um, very fun, cool. Yes, that you could just, there's a link to click on on, on my website and uh, that's a lot of fun. Well, I know what I'm gonna be doing after we finish this, this uh, <laughs> podcast episode. I'll be jumping on there and watching it because okay. no, the, uh, the book definitely sounds really cool. Um, last question before we go, I'm curious to know, uh, what was your uh, inspiration or, uh, reasoning any particular for coming up with the title because i know titles for books can always be i'm sure challenging very difficult i want to try to find something that was provocative and evocative um but that wouldn't tell you too much about what it's really about but yeah that would have a, a creepy again gothic you know sort of sinister feel to it uh and it has multiple meanings um you know, there's the obvious ones, the, the dead bodies who are being desecrated at the morgue. But then if when you read the novel and, and get to the final twists and turns, you realize that there's a whole other meaning to be desecrated as well. Uh, so it was just, a, you know, it, it served a lot of purposes. And I was very excited when I stumbled on it. Awesome. Well, I'm very excited to, uh, to get my hands on it myself, because it definitely sounds like a book that I would enjoy. Great. I hope you do so. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Very excited to read it. And again, big congratulations uh, on writing this book and getting it out there. And can't wait to see what comes next for you. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Absolutely. Be sure to check out John's new book, The Desecrated, available everywhere. And I, for one, can't wait to get my hands on a copy. You never know where things will go in the world of the supernatural and paranormal, which always keeps things fun and exciting. That's all for this episode, so tune in next time to find out what fantastic book we have to share with you all. Take care, and John, any parting words for our listeners? Hi, my name is John Gray. My first novel, The Desecrated, has just been published, and you're listening to GeneBookNerd.com. <laughs>